Hey everyone, today we're going to look at how to set up a Synology NAS from scratch. And we're going to start with the initial setup, then we're going to move to your hard drive configurations and your shared folder configurations. We're then going to quickly look at how you can protect your data and how you can monitor your data. Then we're going to look at security. So this is going to be a pretty long tutorial and we're going to have a bunch of different components in it. So I want to highlight two quick things. The first is that, as always, we have full written instructions in the description. And when you navigate to the website, you're going to see that we have everything broken up into different categories, and you'll quickly be able to reference exactly what you want to do. And the second is that since there will be a bunch of different tutorials broken down in this video, I'm going to pin a comment with timestamps so you can kind of jump around and check out the tutorials that you want. Another thing I want to point out is that you don't necessarily have to do every single one of these and you definitely don't have to do them in sequential order. But if you have a brand new NAS, this video or the written instructions in the description will take you through the entire setup process and ensure that your NAS is set up properly. So before we get started, if you like this video and it helps you out, please subscribe. It really helps me out and helps the YouTube algorithm show this content to more people. So the first thing we're going to look at is how to actually find and set up your Synology NAS. So when you get your NAS and you plug it in, you're going to have to go to find.synology.com to actually find that NAS on your network. And when you do, you're going to walk through the setup process. And as you go through it, it's going to install DSM, and then it's going to ask you to specify a server name, a user account, and a password. Once you do that, it'll ask you to configure Quick Connect. Now, you could do this at a later time if you want, or you can do it now. But Quick Connect allows you to access your NAS from outside of your network without opening any ports on your router. So while it's not necessary, it's a pretty good option if you don't want to expose your NAS to the internet, or you don't have a VPN that you could connect to to actually access your NAS. Once you finish this initial step, DSM will be installed, and now you can move on to configuring DSM. So once DSM is installed and I can access my NAS, the first thing I normally do is I change my IP address and I set it to be a static IP address. Now there are two different ways that you could do this. The first way is that you can make a DHCP reservation in your router's configuration, and this is probably the better way of doing it because you're ensuring that your router won't try and assign that IP address to a different device. But a lot of ISP provided routers don't actually allow you to do that. So the easiest thing that you can do is you can go over to the control panel, access the network interface section, select edit on the LAN device, and then you can use the manual configuration and enter an IP address. Now the default subnet mask, gateway, and DNS servers will be fine. The only thing you'll be changing is that IP address. But it's a good idea to try and use a higher IP address, meaning something over 200 and under 250. And that's just so that your DHCP server doesn't try and assign that IP address to a different device. You also have to keep in mind that a lot of Synology NASes have multiple Ethernet ports. So if you have multiple, you'll have to actually assign each network interface a different IP address. So why normally just set them to be one apart, meaning 240 and 241. When you're done saving this, your DSM session will refresh and your new IP address will be in the URL bar. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to set up a storage pool. And you do that by accessing the storage manager. Now your storage pool is what will actually manage your NAS's hard drives and determine the RAID type that you'll be using. Now the RAID type that you select will kind of be personal preference and it'll really be based on the hardware that you have. But in this tutorial, I'll be using SHR, which is Synology's hybrid RAID. Once you pick the RAID type, you'll see all of your hard drives and you'll have to select them and this will actually delete all of the data that exists on those hard drives. You then have to specify that you'd like to perform hard drive checks and you'll be able to apply that once you're done and this will create the storage pool. So now that our storage pool is created, we have to actually create a volume. Now you can have multiple volumes, and this is once again kind of personal preference, but basically your shared folders that you'll be creating in a future step are actually created on a specific volume. So you can have multiple volumes on a single storage pool, or you can have one volume and allot all of your hard drive space to that one volume. Once again, this is kind of personal preference, but the thing that I'd suggest that's not personal preference here is if you're able to use the BTRFS file system, select that. It has a lot of benefits that the ext4 format doesn't have. 
Once you're done creating your file system, you have the ability to allocate a specific size to this storage volume. So if you will have multiple volumes, it's a good idea to allocate specific sizes for each of them so that you can manage it a little better. Click apply when you're done and this will create your storage volume. Now that our storage pool and our volume is created, we can go in and create a shared folder. Now shared folders are kind of the backbone of a NAS. This is why the majority of people buy a NAS. These are your network folders where you'll be able to access them from your different devices. So you can create as many of these shared folders as you'd like. So you kind of have to think of a structure that you'd like in your head and kind of create different folders based on that. But to create a shared folder, open up the control panel and the shared folder section, and then you're gonna click the create button. Now at this section, you'll have to specify a name and the volume that you'd like to use. So this is the volume that we just created. This is how shared folders tie into the volumes. Change some of the settings around to be what you'd like, and then you're gonna be brought to a page where you can encrypt this shared folder. Now there's a few things that I wanna note about encrypted shared folders. The way that it works is that you have to mount and unmount that shared folder, and you use the encryption key to do that. So when the folder is mounted, it actually functions the exact same as other non-encrypted shared folders will work. But the difference is, when you're done, you can actually go into DSM and you can unmount that shared folder. And if you do, no one will be able to access those files until you mount that folder again. The ultra important point to make here is that if you lose that encryption key, your files will be lost forever. So you have to ensure that you save that encryption key in a password manager, or you save the encryption key file that the Synology NAS will create. I created a tutorial on how you could self-host the password manager Bitwarden, and I'll leave a pop-up up top if you'd like to check that tutorial out. The next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna configure a few of the advanced settings. You're gonna select next, and then you're gonna select apply. This will actually create the shared folder, and it will bring you to a section where you can modify the permissions. So modify the permissions to be what you want, save that, and then your shared folder will be created. So now we're quickly gonna look at how you can protect your data and how you can actually monitor it. So I'm not gonna go step by step for these, but I'm quickly gonna highlight why these are important and why you should consider setting them up. So the first thing we're gonna look at is actually setting up a data scrubbing schedule. So to put it simply, this protects your NAS against bit rot. And we're not gonna really get into what bit rot is, but it's pretty much the degradation of your files. And this is Synology's way of finding and fixing those errors. So you can quickly open the storage manager, navigate to your storage pool, and then you can set up a schedule for data scrubbing. This isn't something that has to be done very frequently, but I'd say at least biannually, you should set this up to run. The next thing we're gonna look at is how to configure snapshots. So snapshots are pretty much a way that your system can freeze your files in time and allow you to recover those files if needed. So the best way to look at this is for whatever reason, if you had a shared folder and today comes and all of those files get deleted for some bizarre reason, you'd be able to go back to your snapshot, look at the actual snapshot from yesterday and restore those files and it would be as if nothing ever happened. So in my opinion, this is something that is mandatory. You have to set this up. You're really just protecting yourself and it's something that functions great. So you have to install the snapshot tool from the package center, but as soon as you do, you'll be able to actually see all of your shared folders and you'll be able to specify a schedule and a retention policy for those snapshots. This is something that you should probably do on all of your shared folders. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna set up a recycle bin emptying task. So when you create a shared folder, you have the option of enabling the recycle bin. And similar to a Windows PC, and I'm pretty sure a Mac, if you delete a file, that file will stay in the recycle bin until you actually empty that recycle bin. Now that's not really a problem on a regular PC because you're not dealing with very large files and you're definitely not dealing with things like snapshots. But since you have snapshots running, you have backups running, they run on a rotation, things are kind of constantly being deleted. And if you don't actually empty that recycle bin, you're gonna be using space on your NAS for no real reason. So to create an emptying schedule, we're gonna open the control panel, 
open the task scheduler, and then we're going to create a new recycle bin schedule task. And at this point, you can specify when you want it to run and how often. You can also specify if all recycle bins should be deleted or if the recycle bin of specific shared folders should be deleted. You also have to specify how long the file should stay in the recycle bin. Now, the next thing I'm going to go over is the storage analyzer. So the storage analyzer is a package that you can install from the package center and it pretty much goes through and it will tell you exactly what shared folders and files are using up space. So you'll be able to see at a glance what on your NAS is using up the most space if you have any duplicate files, etc. So the process is pretty simple, but you'll download the package. You'll go through, specify where you want to save your reports, specify when it should actually run, how often it should run, etc. But at that point, you'll be able to access these reports for the total number of days that you specify these reports are retained for. So, so far, we've looked at the initial setup of a Synology NAS. We've looked at how to create a storage pool, volume, and a shared folder, and how you can protect and monitor your storage pools and files. So the last thing that we're going to look at is the security of your NAS. Now, I'm not a cybersecurity expert, but we're going to go through a few things that can kind of button up the security of your NAS. So before we do that, I just want to say that if you expose your NAS to the internet, meaning that you open a port on your router directly to your NAS and you allow external traffic, you are immediately at a much higher risk than anybody that does not do that. So some of this stuff is actually mandatory if you intend on doing that. If you intend on accessing your NAS via Quick Connect or a VPN tunnel back to your house, the security section is not as important for you, but that does not mean that it's not important. It's definitely something you should do. It's something that you should always continue to improve, but it's not something that is absolutely critical like it is to people who are exposing their NAS to the internet. So the first thing that every single person who is watching this tutorial must do is that they have to configure their DSM update settings. And to do that, you have to access the control panel, update and restore, and then you have to change your update settings and you have to automatically install them at a specific time. Now, not only do updates improve usability by adding new features, they're actually constantly improving the security of your NAS. So these updates are absolutely the most critical thing that you can do to ensure that your NAS stays secure. So after you change your update settings, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to change our default ports. So to do that, you have to go to the control panel and then the network section. And from there, you're going to go into DSM settings. Now the default ports are set as 5000 for HTTP and 5001 for HTTPS. You can change this to something high like 6750 and 6751, but the important point here is that you're changing it to be something that is not 5000 and 5001 because it's known that these are the default ports. So you want to change this right away. While you're in that network section, it's also a good idea to enable denial of service protection. Now you'll have to do that for every single network interface that you have. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to configure auto block. So to do that, you're going to go to the control panel and security. Then you're going to click account and you have to enable both auto block and account protection. Now, the way that this works is it will block the IP address if someone has 10 login attempts within five minutes. So if they incorrectly try and log in 10 times within five minutes, their IP address will be blocked. Now, the same is true of the account protection. They're both kind of redundant. You don't necessarily need both, but it's not going to hurt to keep both of them on. Now, the next thing that we're going to look at is we're going to look at Synology's firewall. Now, this is a big and very important security measure that you can implement. But before we do that, let's look at a few important points. So firewall rules are executed from top to bottom, meaning that all of your allow rules need to be at the top of the list and your very last rule will be a deny all rule. So if you think of this in practice, when a data packet is sent to your NAS, it will go through every single one of your firewall rules from top to bottom. If it cannot find an allow rule, the very last rule will deny that connection. So if you don't have a deny rule at the bottom, you don't have a firewall setup. 
It's also important to note that your allow rules will be completely specific to you and the applications that you're running. So I can't tell you what firewall rules you need to create, but Synology's DSM does a pretty good job of informing you that you need to create a firewall rule if you install a new application. The other important point is that your firewall rules need to be constantly updated. So if you're using SSH, for example, you might have to enable a firewall rule for that SSH port. But at a later time, if you're no longer using SSH, it's a good idea to disable it and to remove that firewall rule. This ensures that your security practices kind of stay up to date. So to enable the firewall, you have to open the control panel and select security. Then you have to select the firewall and you have to enable it. Um, at that point, you have to edit your rules. And the absolute most important thing that you have to ensure that you do is that you have to ensure you allow traffic into DSM. If you don't do that, you might indirectly lock yourself out of your NAS. I'm not gonna go much further into this because these rules are all generally user specific, but check out the written instructions I have because I went a little deeper in the explanation and how you should configure everything. Now, the last thing that I'm gonna mention is from a security perspective, you should really enable two-factor authentication. So two-factor authentication ensures that if your password is compromised, you have a second factor, a second layer of protection that ensures that your account cannot be accessed. So like I said before, these are just a few security practices that you can put into place to button up the security of your NAS. But ultimately, if you're gonna expose your NAS to the internet, you have to implement this and potentially more. And remember that you always have to stay up to date with the best cybersecurity practices. So that was a ton of information in a fairly long video, but I'm hopeful that I broke it up in a way that you were able to follow along and set up your NAS from the start to the point now where it's configured in a fairly sophisticated way. In the written instructions, I have a few additional recommendations where you can build on this base that we just created. If you made it this far, I really want to thank you for watching. I know this was a long video and it was probably boring at certain parts, but I really appreciate you watching it. And I'll once again ask that you please subscribe if you like the content. If this helped you out, give it a thumbs up and share it and leave any questions and tutorial requests in the comments. Thanks again for watching.